I'm joined on the line from Mexico, I'm delighted to say, by the distinguished internationally renowned architect Tatiana Bilbao, who set up her practice in 2004 and uh, two years ago won the Marcus Prize. Her architecture to date has been wide ranging. She's designed botanical gardens, an open chapel, a funeral house. I think very interestingly, a sustainable housing prototype costing barely $8,000 that was showcased at the Chicago Architecture Biennale in 2015. And she's currently working on, um, among other things, a Cistercian monastery in Germany and residential projects in Japan, Mexico and America. Asif Khan joins us from East London. Uh, since setting up his practice in 2007, He's also been award-winning and has designed no less than three Olympic pavilions. He's one of the main architects on the complete reconfiguration of the Museum of London. He's designed museums in Kazakhstan and he's done the entire public space for Dubai Expo 2020 that will take place actually in 2021. Um, welcome both of you, Asif, Tatiana. I want to ask you both, starting with you, Tatiana, um, about how much COVID has had a significant impact on your architectural thinking and approach, given that architecture actually takes time both to be thought through, but also in the planning and the realization. Is it too early to say, or have you started fundamentally to rethink how things might be? Well, I think that what has done for me is accelerating the urgency on the, some of the many topics that I'm working on, because I think that uh, this intense domesticity has uh, really for, for us privileged that we have the possibility to have this intense domesticity, because in my context, that's not the majority. I think it had, has left us to think how important is to really understand the problems and the really problematized domestic sphere that we live in, that we are building for the world, and that we haven't yet achieved to, to build, to, to the majority of the world. So I think that for me, what COVID has done is accelerated the urgency on, on really speaking barely on many, many topics, starting from the core of the house. Asif, does that chime with you? I, th I think, yeah, very much, very much so. I think the process personally, and I think it's a lot of people felt this, it was a chance um, if we weren't affected directly by by the by the illness, to reconsider our relationship with our family, uh, our relationship with those around us, our community, our neighbourhood, um, and our children, you know, so this idea about reinstating of values at the kind of humanistic level is something that I think I'm not the only one who went went through this, and of course, um, that that sort of return to fundamentals, like going back to basics, I think affects how we design. Um, so the questions that we ask now in the design process are much more, uh, yeah, human focused. I think that's just, that's an immediate uh, trigger that's happened. And I think, you know, uh, you know, Tatiana's right. There, there are preoccupations that may have existed before, say in, in my practice, but, but, um, but we're returning to them in, with, with, with great strength and, and, um, uh, with a lot more, uh, belief that we can change things. If, if, the, if domesticity is the core, as you say, Tatiana, um, and, and you've put that into practice with your prototype, for example, is, it, is that an ideal that is not likely to happen because of planning, because of governments, because of scale? Or do you genuinely think that rethinking is possible to implement? I really genuinely think that rethinking is possible to be implemented. First of all, I think that I've always... What I've done this past year is question every project that I'm working on. I, we, we started to understand what have we done. And I think that the year for me started uh, today, a year ago, 8th of March, which was Women's International Day. And I was asked to do a lecture as a protest act. We, we are going to do one tonight as well. Um, and I decided to, to really take protest and uh, by understanding and looking at my work in a, in a feminist pr perspective. And I realized that I was uh, part of the system that is perpetuating, perpetuating discrimination in a very uh, violent way by designing houses that don't allow uh, for equality at all in, in its core. So I, I really started uh, making a, a critique of my own work. We, we immerse ourselves in the first um, um, months of lockdown 
to, to really do a very intense review on what have we done and what can we do for future um, work to really uh, try to create a platform that will erase at the end these uh, per perpetual systems of discrimination within the house and, and expands obviously towards the community in many ways. So uh, we, we did a revision we we started saying well the first of all the first of the things is that we really need to widen our perspective on the idea of accepting diversity in, in the in our designs no so how can we create an architecture that becomes a platform for uh, everyone to build their own existence not our own thoughts on their own existence their own existence and that is how we've been working i mean we started this research way before we, we've already done several um, attempts to, to do that. Uh, the house uh, that you were mentioning, is, uh, which is not a prototype, it's a design strategy, already starts to attempt to understand that there's people that need to, to live completely different from what we think is correctly how they should live. So, um, so yes, I think that for me, has uh, really been um, uh, to expand the notion of the pot of the potential of architecture as a platform instead of architecture as a definite act. I see. Um, I mean, I, I think our, our uh, process, I mean, our, our office is really uh, hands-on and we, we're very much based on prototyping of things physically in the in the studio and one of the difficulties has been the you know the inability to get around a table together and you know to not be able to share um and and challenge each other and build things physically together because we'll, we'll you know for example the work we did in dubai expo was f fully physically prototyped in our office and then built again on site in dubai and you know this process of working together closely to figure out things we take that same approach with a lot of our uh, clients and the user groups that will be involved in the project. The same with, City, with the Museum of London. There's been a lot of dialogue with uh, with the with the users, the audiences, the curators, and so on. Um, I think uh, what's very exciting. Uh, I'm just going slightly off in a tangent. Is the possibility of um, post COVID, um, you know using digital platforms to enable those processes to happen they can't replace being there physically but digital platforms allow kind of a wider level of wider degree of engagement engagement of a different sort uh so have allowed kind of a greater number of people sort of advocacy in the in the design process and there's you know there's a there's also sometimes a risk in that because you uh you take sort of yeah digital impressions they're not the same as as kind of real physical thought and discussion and collaboration uh, but I think there's, there's, this is early stages in, in, in uh, how society is going to evolve. And, you know, the COVID, what COVID did is it brought a lot of these, uh, yeah, digital collaboration tools. Uh, it challenged them and it, it kind of, in a way, it set out what, what we do need in the next stages running forward. So, you know, the idea of what is community um, and, and indeed, like, what is a designer's place in helping that community achieve its results is something that's, I think at the moment being being figured out and, and there's a lot of there's a lot of space to innovate there you know who would imagine that you know an instagram a photo sharing platform like instagram could be like a nexus of so much creative activity i mean it's it's, it's bizarre i mean so the architects the architect's role or designer's role in that in shaping society sort of is is diminished because it's happening all through virtual relationships and comments and likes and so on. So we need to find new ground and, and a new way of helping people um, be part of a built the process of architecture. So I, I think it's, it's very early days. I take the point that um, things have changed, the digital engagement, the opportunity for people to participate in developing places in the future and, and even their own living conditions they can help you make the prototypes and I'm, I'm struck by both of you saying actually we design prototypes and in some ways you know that's there as the beginning of a conversation and then we can start to look at flexibility but call me a cynic but the system itself needs economic underpinning and it's to do with who are, who are the developers or governments or local authorities who are, who are funding all this and um do you think they're ready 
and willing in the current situation to be led by public participation and architects responsive to public need? Or are we still stuck against this system where whoever pays for it ultimately is the person who decides fundamentally what's going to happen? Well, I believe that uh, uh, the, the system will work the same, but I think that it's we the people who would need to do that, <laughs> regardless of the system or with the system even, you know, try to find ways on that. And, and there are many examples in the world. I mean, this is not something that is um, uh, surging because of COVID, as I was saying. I mean, probably before COVID, the things were uh, less visible, but also in, in maybe in, in smaller uh, efforts. But I think that there are many efforts to understand how to really transform the current actual situation, you no, know, in terms of economic and financial uh, development, etc., to uh, benefit really the people, you no, know, and not the capital. And I think that this notion could only just expand, and uh, if, if we are all part of the part of it, you no, know, we we really need to commit, and we really need to be um, understanding that again. I. And what I think is to work for, for people and not for the money. I see. I 100% I, I back what Tatiana says. And that's, that's I think, the, the challenge of being kind of complicit for a lot of architects. All of us are complicit in the kind of real estate market and the real estate industry. Um, there are models that are, um, that are beginning to appear in like, it's, I mean, it's, it's from a completely different field, but like in the crypto world where the idea of sort of value can, uh, the value gained from a, from a project can be kind of realized by future generations. So you can, you can bake into this blockchains, you know, into contracts, the way that profit is shared. So, you know, the, the, one of the challenges of the city and the way that speculative, uh, I talk about London really, speculative development happens. Um, is that it's very much about um, it's like a mining process where um, where value is extracted from a place and then it's transmitted to other places and the the original quarry doesn't benefit over long term right so it gets some some sort of trickle effect but it doesn't really benefit it's just stripped and the community that's there is uh, doesn't benefit but um, uh, I think the, the the form of economic contract that happens between uh, a developer, a place, a community, and then the users has to be evolved. Uh, and it's probably not a kind of instant thing um, uh, because people have to, I guess, slight, slightly shift their, their, way of, um, their way of thinking about um, uh, this as a business model. I think the existing developers need to kind of shift. And I think I've started to hear um, uh, in sort of my developer circle sort of um, um, contacts that younger developers a new generation are starting to think about new ways of of um, of making money basically new ways of doing it which are more uh, they're more about sharing um, because actually that's a, what a lot of people want when they buy a flat they want to know that it has some kind of spread and value and I think I think COVID is, uh, has has heighten the sense of individual responsibility to the uh, to society um you know because it had to so hopefully that i mean that if that's an outcome this could be amazing but it does require some real innovation if we want to talk about innovation it's not about you know one aspect of it is how many flats you can fit on a floor and what kind of hvac you can have and what how the building can be made but another part is about the economic model uh, and if you want to be really innovative it's about thinking about how your kids, kids, kids could benefit from the investment you're making now into city building. Um, that's that's a really clever stuff. And I think I think technology could make that could enable that to happen. But I believe also architecture needs to be, uh, be uh, provide a platform because right now we have uh, dichotomized completely the, the the existence by building public and private space. There's no possibility for us to have a, a common space that would allow us to create a more sustainable shared economy. So I think architecture can do a lot of things. 
So I, for example, a very clear and obvious example that COVID has brought us, no? We not, we now all have to lock down in our apartments, in our small apartments. We have kids and we have elderly people to take care of. And we cannot share that with anyone because we don't have a space. If we want to share it, we have to either invite them to our own private space or invade their own private space. So where is the space where we could share, for example, a day, I could take care of one day of my kids and other kids uh, if I could share that, but where, in my living room? No, I don't think so. So how can, uh, for, 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 for this uh, matter, we can create these spaces? So I think architecture cannot solve the issues. I'm not as naive to think that it can, but I do think that architecture could enable other possibilities, whereas could also no imp, uh, like not be uh, not enable them as well. No, in the mm. same sense. We obviously we're we're talking broadly about what we hope can happen and what we believe might be able to happen. But you two will both be acutely aware of the specifics of individual cities, regions, countries, and so on. You but you both worked in different parts of the world, you both work globally. Um, I, I mentioned at the beginning, Tatiana, that you'd worked uh, as, as an advisor to development of housing for the federal government of Mexico City. Admittedly, that was 17, 16, 17 years ago. But do you see different models in different parts of the world where there's a more enlightened approach to planning and public engagement that could be rolled out as a model elsewhere? Or do you think it really is the case that that you know, the broad public will and the desire for architects to, to consult has to be done on a local basis. It's the only way you can conceive of it. Well, I think that it has to be done on like a local basis. I think it's absolutely crazy that now you ask someone in Sri Lanka and someone in North Dakota, and they all imagine the same way of living. Their dream house is exactly the same whether they they have completely different backgrounds, completely different cultures, completely different weather conditions, completely different everything, right? But they imagine the same because of a globalized media um, per perception that has direct our minds to think that we all need to live the same. But I think the solutions need to be really localized. The solution need to be understanding the cultural necessities of each um, place. But as I said, I think it's it, it's impossible to do that. And if we think that we could probably create something that everyone could uh, adopt at its own, then there is an open possibility. But there are models in the world of uh, developing systems, and I, I'm very much interested in what's happening in Berlin, because in Berlin it's happening right like as, as a whole movement of um, uh, there is in, inclusive disorganization, which is super interesting, the syndicates of tenements, where there is happening lots of uh, different housing um, uh, situations coming up in very different ways but it's a whole system a whole platform that is supporting them uh, financing them uh, arranging the the, the 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 organizations and keeping them together so i think that that is something we could develop as a system but then find the individual solution you know, for each uh, specific place and locality in its own way, you not know, culturally, socially, spatially speaking. You, you mentioned Berlin, and um, the com I'm going to have a there's a keynote conversation this afternoon with David Chipperfield, who is obviously has been responsible for um, reconfiguring and, and almost re excavating various institutions in Berlin. And he's an, a major architect, uh, but he doesn't seem to have a signature style. Nonetheless, the idea of the leverage that successful big name architects can bring to projects and what it permits them to do is something that um, is, is, is obvious and that often uh, clients want those names. Now, both of you now have that kind of status. I mean, you may not see yourself as architects and maybe we don't use that term, but you're recognizable international architects. Um, is that something that you feel you can leverage or do you think the collaborative model of architects, I'm thinking, Asif, in your case, of working with other practices like Stanton Williams on the Museum of London, Julian Harrop and others, whether the way forward is 
even in social housing, which we're, we're, we're rooting this conversation in, it isn't about one architectural practice. Or, or am, I, am I being too utopian in that way? And it has to be controlled by one, one studio in the end. Oh, I, the question of kind of collaboration and egos and all of that. <laughs> I think maybe so it's, it's, a, it's challenging to do anything if you're, uh, if you're doubling up on things. So if, 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 um, if we're both chefs and, uh, you know, Gordon, Gordon Ramsay and Marco Pierre White probably will never cook again together and it will be impossible for them to be in the kitchen together ever again. Um, but I think that's a sort of old school uh, approach. Sometimes you can find collaborative partners and you can design together. I think the challenge is to be to be not repeating the same thing. It's rather to be uh, complementing each other. And so skills should be different. So if you have an architect who specializes in ecological approaches, an architect who specializes in kind of humanistic approaches, and that together that marriage uh, can be can be wonderful. Um, I think what we should see. I mean, uh, the perfect sort of um, city is one where uh where uh, many voices are represented so you have you have the kind of um the real estate voice and the one the, the architect who's trying to achieve the maximum uh, return on investment and you have working with them uh, the ecological architect and working with them the humanistic one and working with them the aesthetic kind of uh, uh aesthetic approach and pure beauty and I think the, comp the, the kind of combination of that, because um, the projects today are very complex and number of stakeholders, maybe 50 years ago that can be held in one person's mind. Uh, although that, that idea was probably, um, it's probably a, a false impression we've been given by history that one guy held all these things. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it's probably nonsense. Uh, probably was always collaboration. But I think that to make a really good city, you need diversity, not only in the people who live there, but in the people that design it. Uh, and that makes sure that when you that it has like real resilience. Uh, so I think it's it's important for clients, at, you know, city builders, uh, clients, uh, to make sure that their projects uh, have a wide variety of designers uh, involved in them. I think that's really really uh, key to success. It's a basic uh, basic thing, and I'm happy to work with it with, in those sorts of teams um, that are diverse. I hope we have a right to the century where the architect becomes an enabler and not a signature. I believe that we really um, need to understand how to become part of the system that uh, produces space and not the signature that creates a mark on it. So hmm. you're teaching, I mean, you've both taught, but you're a visiting professor, Tatiana, at, the, at Yale, at the School of Architecture there at Yale University. Um, how are the architects of the future being trained? I mean, is, is it the, with the idea of um, enabling not not being signature, or do you see the tendency in people to want to be great auteurs still? I think that it's uh, in between. We're in between phases, and definitely the the idea of uh, the signature architects is dying, and there are many many forces pulling to the other side not to, to understand how to create enablers and not um, name architects. And, uh, but still, I think we are in between, as I said, in mainstream schools, things are changing rapidly, but not in, not, it's not yet permeating in the whole system. And I think it's not only about changing um, a, that situation on what is the purpose of, uh, of the profession, but also changing the way we teach I mean, we have to understand that uh, if we are going to erase the uh, signature architect, we should erase the signature professor as well. And I know this is something controversial, but I believe that um, for me, at least teaching is not about preaching. Teaching is about learning and, and, uh, and about understanding that I, the one that learns the most is me. And if I learn the most, everybody else will do as well. So. For me, it's a it's a process of exchange, and as 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 Sif was saying, no, there's there's people with certain strengths, and there's people with other ones, and there's everywhere everywhere um, a, a place where we can all learn from each other and build the, build this way each other uh, more constructively. I, I I would um one idea I just had. What, 
is a, uh, when Tatiana, when you were speaking, was also the idea of um, the, the, the benefit of a single person is um, the idea of accountability, which means when um, somehow a collaborate, collaboration, which I've, I've been in lots of collaborations, somehow the, the accountability is dispersed through everyone. And not, it just makes it more difficult to track how a decision got made when something happened, when, when the outcome is not desirable, because often design process won't always create yield the best outcome. So I think somehow we have to bake in the idea of um, not necessarily the signature architect in the, in the traditional sense of the kind of hero, although that can be useful as well. You need a Neil Armstrong sometimes, even if he didn't do, even if he just landed it, he, he didn't build the ship, but he did something. It's important for, for the country to have people like that. But somehow you need to know how we ended up here and who's not whose fault was it <laughs> somehow because uh it helps you to move on generation to generation if you're able to kind of identify what specifically was a challenge and you know who was a challenge and uh so somehow we need to find that figure that out but uh, i think diverse collaborations are really the best the best way to make to make good design Okay, in the in the uh, three minutes we've got left, I'm going to chuck a really big philosophical question at you both, and you can you can groan, but it's about responsibility. Uh, it's often said, and it's something I want to tease out with conversations with artists too, that artists themselves only have a, only have a responsibility to themselves. Uh, I think that when it's in the public domain is not true, but anyway, that's that's a kind of romantic notion. Obviously, architects, in some ways, you have a creative responsibility to yourself but you also have a public responsibility because of the built environment and what you're putting out there. Do you think that our, our, the responsibilities of architects have changed in the last few years? Should they change or are they, are they as they've always been, slightly, slightly hazy? Tatiana. Well, I believe that um, we kind of changed the, the, the scope or the lens of the responsibility of the architect in the last 50 years. And we really um, uh, separated ourselves from the true responsibility. The true responsibility for me is to understand that the built environment creates a really big impact in the life of anyone. So, um, and I think we we were really thinking that maybe through the the impact in the capital capitalistic marketing world, we could create an impact. But I think that we we in the way forgot who we work for which is human beings so i do think that the responsibility is changing and should uh, the understanding of the responsibility is changing and should change asif uh i think i i, I think when you meet it it's difficult to say what is a true artist nowadays um because they're so engaged with the market of, of art and, and when you discover, when you meet a true artist today, you probably won't even recognize them in what you think an artist is because uh, they, they may not be discovered, you know. And I think the same with a, an architect. Architects are also so part of a machine today that they may not be the, they may not be, when you meet the true architect, you may not see them as that. And I, I just think, um, uh, I think we need to find ways to make a broader range of voices part of the, creation of the built environment that's uh, and the art world tim <laughs> that, that would be wonderful well i i come from the art world um and uh one of the reasons i invited you both to take part in this discussion is because in your creative approaches you straddle that world there is a creative and artistic aspect very much to what you do but you also have to wrestle with the philosophical and pragmatic issues around the built environment um you talked about uh teaching not preaching Tatiana and um, both of you have taught me quite a lot in this conversation and I didn't feel I was being preached at ever however I do look forward to with great interest the unveiling of your monastery if the public can visit it in Germany I want to do so and likewise Asif I intend to try and get to Dubai for the unveiling of Expo 20 in 21 but we've now hit time it was a pleasure a very intense brief pleasure but thank you Asif Khan and Tatiana Bilbao <laughs>